Well, hello everybody. Christ is risen. I know we are all eagerly anticipating hearing from our Metropolitan, hopefully tomorrow, and finding out uh, kind of what the path forward is. Father Justin and I really miss having you at church. We really do. And we're looking forward to, uh, to opening the doors once again. Hopefully that'll be soon. Hopefully it'll be soon. We'll find out um, again, hopefully more tomorrow. We're not quite sure, but ideally it'll, it'll be tomorrow. Uh, for today's video, uh, this may be a little bit of a longer video than I normally do, but I want to cover quite a bit of, of uh, information, quite a few topics that I think are really important to um, maybe having a, an overview of everything that's been happening and looking at things within the proper perspective. Now, my perspective, I'm sure there will be those who disagree with it. Um, however, I'm going to explain why I view this the way that I do, and I think Father Justin would agree. And I'll also kind of explain a little bit about why I think we need to view it in this way. So what am I talking about? Well, first of all, I want to explain I'm not a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> That's not my personality. It's never been the way that I think. However, I think it's important to be able to view the kind of arc of history and understand where we're going. Where we're going as a culture, as a people, as a country, it really where we're going as a world. Where are we headed with everything right now? And the coronavirus, really the whole response to this is only the, the most modern manifestation uh, showing us where we're going. There's, there's been a lot more happening in the world that's been happening for decades. That kind of shows us the dangerous path that we're on. We need to know as Orthodox Christians what the signs of the times are. We don't live in a normal world. We don't live in any normalcy really whatsoever. Life has become so abnormal that that has been normalized for us. There's that incredible quote from St. Anthony where he says that in the last times, insane people will walk the streets. And when they see the one sane person, they'll look at him and say, you're crazy because you're not like us. I think that's where we're headed. I think that's really where we are. And I think it's only going to get worse. But looking at the, the modern uh, um, kind of issue that we're dealing with right now with the coronavirus and the response, I think it's become more pronounced that we need to have an orthodox phronema. That's the word for mindset. It's a little bit deeper than that, but that essentially carries the meaning. We need to have an orthodox mindset about how we look at things and how we live and how we move forward. The more orthodox our mindset is, the more we realize just how much of a fallen world we live in and we know how to respond to it properly. St. Paul has this incredible line in 2 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 10, verse 5, where he says, Take every thought captive. Every thought. This is, this is why every single thing that we think, everything that we do, the very way we live, the very way we breathe, needs to be informed and infused with and by Christ. Christ really needs to teach us how to look at things. What's the proper Orthodox view of the sexual revolution? Or feminism? What's the proper orthodox view of economics and of politics? This isn't to say that, that uh, orthodoxy says you have to believe only one thing and one thing only about every issue. You can be one of many different types of flowers, and this is orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is a beautiful field with many different flowers. Some are more fragrant than others. Some are red, some are blue, green. Some have thorns. Some are soft. There's room for a lot of different views. But because there's room for a lot of views, it doesn't mean that there's room for every view. And again, we want to be able to have enough of an orthodox mindset, to have our thoughts captive to Christ, to be able to read the situation around us properly. So where am I going with this? What, what is this really all about? We want to be balanced, not going too far to the left or too far to the right. And I've seen, I've seen unbalance all over the place. Thank God. Father Justin mentioned this yesterday, he, he and I have both noticed that the vast majority of the parishioners here have been very, very balanced. We've been very happy about that. Um, it really, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been reassuring to see how balanced people are in this thing. Where they can say on the one hand, I don't like the way we're responding to this. However, I can see how I can benefit in this situation. They're taking it as, be as best they can. Unfortunately, in a few cases, we've seen people go too far in both ways. In one case, there was somebody who emailed one of us and said that he didn't just disagree with our approach, but that we were kowtowing 
to secularism within the church. And therefore, because we could still do liturgy, we're hypocrites, we're modern day Pharisees. And really, that person who wrote this is the true example of what a Christian should be. I have to tell you, anybody who condemns all the clergy and all the other Christians who don't, who don't agree with them on everything, they're doing themselves far more harm than not going to churches. They're harming themselves. And frankly, they don't know the faith. They really don't know the faith. But the more we live the faith, the more it gets ingrained into our hearts and we start, we start uh, gaining this ability to be able to read the times properly and know how to respond to them in a way where we can disagree but still benefit. That's really what we want to get to. So on the other side, there have been quite a few people who have been saying that any disagreement with either church or even civil authorities is ridiculous. I saw a video by one priest who said, we're not being persecuted at all. And if you think so, you're not going to be able to handle real persecution when it comes. Okay. Is this outright persecution? Are Christians being slaughtered in the streets? No. No, they're not. But there's a deeper persecution happening. It's a deeper and more dangerous one. Why? Because Christ tells us not to fear those who can harm the body, but fear those who can harm the soul. And souls are being harmed. They have been for a long time. Our culture has become anti-Christian. And I want to explain a little bit about that. So, how can we read the signs of the time? And how can we see some of this underlying persecution that I think eventually may lead to true and outright persecution? How do we know we're on that, on that path? A few things. Firstly, look to the schools. Whether you go to elementary school, middle school, high school, college, there's something that's not taught anymore. It's not taught as a requirement. In the vast majority of schools, the ability to think is not taught. We don't teach people how to think. Thinking is a skill. To think logically and properly through something is a skill that we need to have. We don't teach it in elementary school because it's not utilitarian. How many students are going to grow up and become philosophy professors? Not very many. And so we don't teach it. However, how can you get through life without knowing how to think? As an example of this, you can just look at almost any debate, really argument, on social media. And what do you see? I've had a few debates. It's been a long time since I really tried not to do that anymore. But I had, I had uh, debates with people on Facebook where their responses showed that they didn't know how to follow a simple, logical argument. They'd get wrapped up in everything but what I was saying. And what I was saying, they would almost deliberately misunderstand so they could attack it with straw man attacks. They didn't know the basics of logic. One of the best courses I ever took, in my first year of college, I took a, a course just on the topic of logical fallacies and how to avoid them. And we had to memorize a lot of them. We had to memorize their Latin names. We had to memorize how they're utilized. And we had to memorize how not to do them. It was really beneficial. And it taught me how to look at an argument and see whether the argument someone's making is fallacious or not. Unfortunately, today people don't know how to think. And they really argue based off of emotion rather than logic. Now, you may sit there and say, well, wait a minute. How important is this for us Orthodox? We always talk about how knowledge of the heart is the most important thing. It's true. That's true. It is the most important thing. But God gives us logic, head logic, as a tool. And it's a tool that we need to learn and become familiar with and utilize properly. St. Gregory Palamas has an entire book that he wrote against the filioque, the Roman Catholic uh, term that they added to the creed and the Son, claiming that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and not just the Father through the Son. And one of the things he says over and over again is that those who teach this doctrine do so because they do not know proper logic. Again and again, he uses that argument. He says that they have become against true logic, and that's what leads them down this false path. So yes, we want revealed theology, but until that point, we want to be able to understand things properly. Today, people are not taught how to think. And so what happens is because you're basing everything off of emotions, you're told. You're told how to respond. 
We look at any movie, any TV show, and what happens? The proper music sets in, the proper camera angles, everyone says the right things, and you're being told, this is a time for you to feel sad, or this is a time for you to feel angry, this is a time for you to feel excited. That may be fine for entertainment with movies, but we should be able to think through those things and say, well, wait a minute, this does or doesn't make sense. Unfortunately, this is how we approach all of life. We've taken the false realities of movies and television and we've placed them to real life. And we have these guttural emotional reactions and we can't properly think through them. And that means that we have to trust something or someone to tell us what to properly believe. It's been shocking how many people believe every government prediction that comes out, despite the fact that they're constantly revising them. First, they say 200,000 are going to die. Then it's 100,000. Now it's 60,000. Again and again, we're being told who to believe, but never do we sit back and question and say, well, wait a minute, if you keep getting this wrong, at what point, at what point do we raise a red flag and say, maybe this isn't the right way to go? So we're not, we're not really taught how to think anymore. We have a culture that doesn't know how to think properly through things. Second, there's the rise of what's called the grievous studies in universities. Grievous studies grievance studies, are where victimhood equals truth. So the more you can show that you're a victim, the more we're supposed to honor your voice as being truthful, whether what you're saying is true or not. So if you're a minority when it comes to race, if you're a minority when it comes to sexual orientation, if you're a minority when it comes to gender identity and all these different things, the more boxes you can check that show you're a victim, the more legitimacy your voice has. So there was a late 2019 poll, and it found that more than one in three millennials view communism favorably. And so does nearly 30% of what they call Generation Z. Why is this important? What does this have to do with grievance studies? Marxism is based in an idea that everything can be viewed through the lens of those who have power and those they have power over. Everything is viewed in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the terms of power. And so when you look at grievance studies, there are those who are just dismissed outright because there's too many of you and you have too much power. And therefore, what you're saying doesn't matter if you think it's true or not. We're going to dismiss it outright. And you see this all the time. You know, People are screamed at because they're you know, white cisgender males and a white cisgender male is automatically evil for being that and therefore we don't want to listen to them at all because there's an imbalance of power and they've had it for too long we see this a lot with christianity christianity is seen as having had power for much much too long this is also why christianity is seen in such a negative light by so many because the very doctrines and beliefs that we practice are seen as telling minorities that the way they live is not right, especially when we look at sexual minorities. And therefore, Christianity is labeled as hate speech or bigotry. And once you engage in hate speech or bigotry, again, you're on the side of those who have power and you should be dismissed outright. Next, we see a big movement pushing against free speech today in society. There was a 2019 survey that found that a whopping 41% of college students believe that anything deemed hate speech should not be protected by the First Amendment. Now, of course, the obvious question is, well, who defines what is hate speech and what isn't? Well, again, because things are, are put in this Marxist dialectic, those who feel that speech has been hatefully directed towards them are going to be right no matter what. You cannot teach traditional Christian doctrine without being considered a bigot who preaches hate speech. And there are many, 41% of college students, who believe that that speech should not be protected, should not be free. This also has resulted in what's been called cancel culture. Cancel culture is when there's something done on a TV show or by a celebrity or a college speaker with whom the victim grievance study crowd disagrees with, they are not to be debated. They're to be silenced. Again and again, 
on college campuses, which used to be universities. The very word university includes this idea that we want to search all knowledge for truth. Not today. Not today. In many universities, if you go to a college campus as a speaker, not, not towing the party line, the grievance study line, they try to cancel you altogether. And many times those speeches are canceled. If they're not canceled, protesters constantly interrupt and keep you from talking. Now, if you want to see an example of everything that I've just said, look to Christianity in, pro in popular culture. In 2019, I think it was uh, an October or November survey, it was found that over 10% of scripted characters, not shows, characters, 10, over 10% 10 of scripted characters on network television identified as something within the LGBT community. Notice that if it's over 10%, it's an overrepresentation from the actual population. And statistics range from half a percent, less than half, a quarter of a percent, all the way to maybe four or five percent. So let's put it in the middle. Let's say it's two percent, over 10 percent of characters are represented as Christians. However, the last study I could find showed that there are 65 percent of people in the United States who still identify as some sort of Christian. And yet, what is their representation on network television? How often have you seen Christians portrayed on television shows? And what's more, how often have they been positively portrayed? When was the last time that you saw a major character, or even a side kid, they're usually side characters, who was a Christian who wasn't also shown to be a judgmental and hypocritical ignoramus? It almost never happens. It absolutely almost never happens. So this is the culture that we're in right now. It's a culture that is actively seeking not only to ignore, but to fight against Christian values and to subvert them. And we have to be able to look around and see the tactics of the secularists. Open persecution indeed comes slowly. And sometimes it doesn't come at all. Sometimes they find that the best thing to do the far more effective way to persecute Christians is to harass, to dehumanize, and to dishearten them. All the while trying to tempt them away from their Christian faith. Certainly that's happening today. About 70% of Christian high school students, 70%, once they go to college, lose their faith. The universities are the place, that's, that's the... Um, that's like the, the home base of all of this. That's where the true fight is taking place. And once they come out of university, not able to think logically through things, thinking with emotions, looking with grievance studies in their background, and having turned away from their faith, these people become tomorrow's rulers. It's already happening all around us. So how does this happen? What's the pattern that we want to look for? Well, we've already discussed not teaching people how to think logically or in a nuanced way and teaching people to really um, uh, kind of speak with their emotions first. Now, beyond that, the secularists have taken one Christian virtue, the golden rule, treat others as you would want to be treated, and they've, they've grasped that for themselves and corrupted it. So the one Christian virtue that they hold up above everything else is the virtue of compassion. But they've taken compassion and corrupted it away from what Christ actually was talking about. Kindness and compassion are not the only Christian virtues. They have to be placed within the proper context. But if you take those terms and you corrupt them, and you make them mean what you want them to mean, then what happens? Well, then you can show that Christians are actually uncompassionate by this new definition. And so you can say that Christians don't actually act like Christians. All Christians are hypocritical, and therefore their faith is a sham. So, while this is happening, of course, you still can't openly persecute Christians. There are those who will look around and see that open persecution and be against it. Let's say, as much as I disagree with them, we can't treat them that way. And so what do we do? 
we create or exploit a crisis. It's important to create or exploit a crisis. Why? Because that drives people into fear. And fear causes people to think even less rationally. You slowly use that fear to chip away at the essential nature of the faith. You show faith to be unimportant, or to use today's term, unessential. Christianity and faith today are unessential. They're not essential. Abortion clinics, essential. Church, not essential. Not essential to your life. And you slowly move from showing faith to be non-essential and unimportant to being outright dangerous. That's the next step of the process. Show faith to be dangerous. You make those who insist on practicing their faith social pariahs. Why? Because they are willing to harm other people, which is, again, the highest virtue is compassion, and that's uncompassionate. It's wrong to do that. And that's why those insisting on opening the churches and coming to church are being told, well, you don't care about other people's lives. People will die because of you. Now think about that for a second. Today, we harm others by wanting to be at church because of a virus with less than half a percent of a death rate. What's going to happen tomorrow? Tomorrow, I guarantee you, we will be told that our very Preaching is harmful. Why? Because you have members of the LGBT grievance studies community who are anxious and depressed and even suicidal because of your preaching of traditional Christianity. And therefore, you are dangerous and you need to be silenced. That's what we're seeing. That's where we're going. If you don't believe me, look to some of the articles that you can find online about these very topics, not a lot of people say them outright. It's very, very rare that you see the secularists actually openly state what their goal is. But every now and then you get a glimpse. I'm reminded of this, this um, LGBT activist. I think her name was Masha Gessen. And you can listen to the audio online. She's talking to a group of activists. This is before uh, gay marriage was legalized. And she says that of course, it's a given. Of course, gay marriage should be legalized. But her real belief is that marriage shouldn't exist as an institution at all. And the crowd she was speaking to did what? They erupted in applause. Every now and then, they tell you what the real goal is. The real goal is to destroy marriage. The real goal here is to wipe out Christians' influence out in every way in society to get rid of it completely. We see this all around us. We see this spiraling down. The far left secularists, and I want to mention here, there certainly are far right secularists as well. Believe me, there are far right secularists who are just as dangerous. But the far left secularists are the ones that really control the vast majority of education of media, and of entertainment in this country. Think about that. Every place that we get ideas from, every place we get information from, is really controlled by far-left secularists. Education? It's hard to find a conservative professor on any college campus. It's, fine. it's very difficult to find a traditional Christian professor. Media? People say, Fox News, Fox News. Well, yes, but okay, CNN... MSNBC, ABC, NBC, CBS, newspapers, most of them, magazines, and entertainment, which is clear. It's the far-left secularists that really have control here. And we have to be aware of what their ultimate aim is. I hear all the time people say, well, they're not doing that right now. Well, no, you don't do it all at once. You do it incrementally. The person who showed the, the blueprints for how to get this done is a name you might have heard. His name was Saul Alinsky. And he wrote a book called Rules for Radicals. I've read just portions of it here and there. It's pretty terrifying because it shows how accurately he knew that people would, maybe, maybe they're taking their cues from him, but it shows exactly how you create social and societal change, a cultural and societal change over time, and you overcome this, this uh, traditional Christianity, which he calls the enemy. 
it's very telling though. It's very telling that at the very beginning of his book, he has three quotes. He begins his book with three quotes, one from a rabbi, one from the founding father Thomas Paine, and one from himself. And the quote from himself says this, Lest we forget at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical, from all our legends, mythology, and history, and who is to know where mythology leaves off and history begins, or which is which, the first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom, Lucifer. The playbook of the secularist left comes from, largely, this man, Saul Alinsky, who was a great admirer of Marx and Stalin and Lenin. And at the very beginning of his book, he made sure to acknowledge Satan. Now, having said all this, I don't want you to despair. That's not the point of any of this. You know Father Justin, you know myself, we're not despairing people. We're not depressed people. We know that in the end, God will have the last word. And we see that there are spiritual fruits being born out of the situation. After all, out of the crucifixion came the resurrection. That happens daily for us. So this is not the time for disobedience. Father Justin has spoken, and I've spoken, with quite a few priests who we really respect, many of whom are holy, and holy monastic figures and elders, and they've all told us the same thing. The, the message is universal, and we know that we can trust this because they have the phronema, the mindset of the church. They have taken every, they've taken every thought captive. And universally, they say, the time for disobedience will come, but this isn't it. This isn't it. We can disagree with this, and we have to take this seriously. But for right now, that's the lesson. We'll be obedient as much as we can be. But at the same time, we have to look at the signs of the time and realize we need to take our faith more seriously. We need to start living our faith more seriously. We need to live our faith as strongly as possible. We need to be ready for much worse persecution, which indeed will come and is coming. At the same time, we need to start fighting against this. Even if we know we're going to lose, we may lose culturally, but we want to make sure that we do the right thing regardless. And while losing with the entire culture, there may be individuals along the way who are inspired by our faith. We need to start speaking up about this. We need to start being much stronger about this. And the only way to do that is if we too are seeking after the phronema of the church. We want the heart of Christ. That means we need to be very serious daily about our prayers, about our fasting, prostrations, almsgiving, when the church is open, church attendance. Until then, more prayer at home. We need to be transformed in this. What does St. Seraphim of Sarov say? Acquire the spirit of peace and thousands around you will be saved. The reality is, is that while we completely disagree with a lot of the people pushing the stuff I just talked about, we still have to love them. But they won't be transformed by our arguments. We're not going to argue them into righteousness. We're not going to argue them out of their position. All we can do is provide an example of holiness and pray. So get serious. If you think you've been serious, get more serious. If you haven't been serious, now is the time. We need to be prepared to fight against this. And how do we fight? St. Porfirios tells us. We don't fight directly against the darkness, screaming at it. Rather, we bring more light in. But while doing that, yes, we need to raise our voices every now and then. Father Justin and I will be doing that with, and Father Justin has, with some secular authorities. We'll be doing that with individuals. We'll be having good conversations with our fellow priests, with our hierarchs. But you need to as well. Take this time seriously. Utilize it the best you can. Have no fear. There's no room for fear here but we do need to be aware of what's happening around us. Be aware, be alert, and be faithful. Christ is risen. God bless you. I hope to see you soon.